Well, rising family, another edition of The Cosmic Mother has returned. I am your host, Ahmad Blair Brown, and this is We Meditate. Welcome again. After an extended break, we're picking right back up for The Great Mother. And in this particular episode, we're talking about the Giandriest aspect of The Great Mother. Now, when we talk about the spiritual essence or the spiritual presence, that is the the undergirding energy for all of all of this physical existence that taps into the dimension that existed prior to this. The great mother, if we are looking at it from a practical human form for our intellectual analyzation, we will actually have to say that the great mother is actually not a woman at all. We consider the Great Mother a woman uh, because of the birthing nature that the Great Mother has, meaning that all things that have come to be and will come to be all emerged from her, i.e. a birth. However, the dry, the giandrious nature of the Great Mother consists of an energy that is complete in and of itself, meaning that it is not feminine by just a one side or one dimensional entity like a woman that you may see walking around it is actually more akin to her to a hermaphrodite meaning that it has both masculine and feminine energies in it to an equal balance and portion to where it can literally self-generate and self-create on its own so essentially what we're saying is um the great mother that we're talking about that is the undergirding embodying presence of this particular universe is actually both man and woman in energetic form and essentially this um this combination of energies we can see it being expressed because it is um or shall i say as the energies um emanate from the great mother and slow down in vibration and begin to quote unquote divide from one another and separate from one another you will see the manifestations of masculine and feminine in all things. Of course, the easiest is looking at a human. You see a man and a woman, but the same male and female um, presence exists literally in every single molecule, every single atom, every single entity that you can look at. If it's not strictly masculine or feminine, it is positive and negative in its energetic charge. So we've got um, male and female plants. We've got male and female dogs, cats, every other mammal that you could think of. We have male and female insect types as far as their different uh, structures are concerned, not necessarily the basic anatomy. But regardless of such, we still see that this um, this uh, dualistic, so to speak, um, energetic structure that is all around us that actually is us. And so as we draw closer to the energetic source of all things, this division, this division based energy of masculine and feminine being against each other or going in two opposite directions. I have two totally different uh, ways of processing things that begins to become more mute. And as the energy or you or me or any other person begins to draw closer to their inner singularity, they are essentially bringing both that masculine and feminine energy within themselves um, to gather together in their inner core. And then as they begin to do so, yes, their outer core, um, you know, will primarily remain the same. You're not going to transform into, you know, the opposite sex or something like that. Um, but what happens is your presence of mind and your mental abilities and your emotional abilities begin to tap into different parameters, awarenesses, and abilities that they simply did not have before. And that is, again, because you're bringing all of the energies back together in a more condensed and effective form for your everyday behavior, but also for your spiritual transmission. Because if you bring the energies together from the source within you, connect it to the source that is fueling this whole existence, you now make yourself much, much more of a conduit for that source energy to simply flow because you are matching the same flow as well. And so that is just an intro. How y'all doing? <laughs> so getting right into it, getting back to the uh, hermaphroditic nature of the great mother, 
we're going to explore some of these hermaphroditic natures as they express themselves in real world terms. Um, one of the common themes dealing with this book as far in, in as far as the uh, first set of entries, things about sex have come up very, very regularly. Um, when we talk about uh, spirituality, um, when we're talking about the spirit realm, the continuum of sex is actually very, very important and inclusive of our primary existence. And as most of us are brought up in the modern age, and as um, many listeners here are from the West, um, our many listeners are at least brought up in a Eurocentric um, um, type of culture. Uh, most of us have have um, been indoctrinated or live within a overarching structure or over uh, our larger sense of culture where sex and spirit or sex and the body or simply sexual interaction as a as a whole is considered something separate from the good of society or something that is needs to be critically uh, managed. You know, or just basically they treat and teach sex under the same auspices of of division. And uh, so particularly um, when we're looking at these things with the cosmic mother, we're tapping into the energetic form that, again, is still both hermaphroditic, masculine and feminine. But it is a mother based energy, meaning that the vast majority of this energy is of the negative polarity. And in that negative polarity, there is much more chaos. And now, again, chaos in a very societal term is a bad thing, but chaos in an energetic term is a beautiful thing. That is your potential energy. And so in the same aspect of potential energy, when we keep it in its purest form and do not try to manage it as it transmits into physicality, we will see that this mother energy in regards to sexual identity creates the exact same transmission that I spoke of before. It can open one up to a more sexual fluid nature in their activity. Now, talking about this is going to be um, very, very, um, what's the right word here? Talking about this can be very frightening for some people uh, because again, most of us do not deal with the great mother in, in an intellectual form. Most of us simply deal with it in the visceral emotional form and we never actually bring the great mother into the uh, left hemisphere of our masculine brain and allow those energies to again come into contact with one another and allow transformation to occur. So again, most of us only know the great mother through either some type of religious tradition or some type of spiritual grouping where um, where, again, the central motif is patriarchal, is masculine focus, where the primary reason why you're doing any of those spiritual things is to create a shift in change in your outward projection by trying to change your physical environment. Again, that's not a bad thing. But again, if you are only tapping into the, the cosmic mother without any form of intellectual um, engagement other than using her for for your own physical um, for your own physical needs, uh, you are only just grabbing the energy and using it as a tool. You're not grabbing the energy and growing in relationship with it. See, there's much different. You could you could grab a hammer and just immediately go to hammering or you can grab a hammer and then learn about what a hammer is and learn all of the different functions of a hammer, learn all of the different things that a hammer can do. Yes, essentially, it only does one thing. It nails things into the wall. But there's also a backside of the hammer, how you can learn to pull nails out. There's also different sides of the hammer that can you could use to nail different um, nail in different types of material. Um, there's other functions you could do. Just do a search of DIY, so to speak. And the, that same type of premise, though, is where you could apply to anything. If a hammer is too simple, fine. Let's look at a cell phone. Everyone, <laughs> darn near everyone has a cell phone and darn near everyone's cell phone is actually way more complex than what they think it is. Your cell phone has way more functions within it beyond uh, talking, texting, getting on social media and listening to YouTube videos like this one. You can do way more with it, but if you only use it as a tool, i.e. like religion only uses the great mother as a tool or primarily, let's not say only, let's not be one sided, but primarily uses it as a tool. You never grow in full relationship with your phone. You never learn every single thing that you can do with it. And the only way that you can is through um, a closer investigation. And again, the closer investigation is 
using the right brain, um, excuse me, the left brain, the masculine aspect of your brain, and not using it strictly for structuring things, i.e., um, like they say, yes, using using it for structure. The uh, the masculine hemisphere of the brain and the masculine energy is the structure based energy. That is the father God. That is the God that wants to bring light out of darkness. Again, going those things metaphysically, all it talks about is learning how to use potential energy and making it into physical energy and using it in a in a way that brings about change. But again, the best way to bring about change is to grow in a relationship with the first initial energy that is change itself. So again, this has been an extreme roundabout introductory way of getting right back to, again, this whole sexual nature of things, because again, it was about the whole, uh, the uh, religious infiltration with the great mother. When we talk about the great mother and how these things about uh, her birthing aspect, um, when we talk about the sexual nature of women being being suppressed under religion, when we talk about how the culture in its patriarchal uh, ways is is what's causing the earth to be spun out of control. All we're talking about here is the centralized idea that the suppression of the core of your base energy, which actually is your sexual energy, your sexual um, affluence. That is actually the core base expression of your spirit or your soul. And so if your spirit and or your soul has been intellectually guided through a cultural system that has been designed to suppress the great mother, that has been designed to only see the core and presence and essence of things as something to manipulate and not something to grow in relationship with. We, in turn, do not grow in full on relationship with our own spiritual awareness and with the spiritual core of all things. And so with that being said, let's begin the reading. It says, in truth, Western Christianity stereotype of weak femininity and strong masculinity are among the most extreme in history. Many of these sex role traits originated from the privileged classes. The only people who could afford passive and dependent women and for whom a bored and indulgent lifestyle made sex role playing an amusement. Bound feet among the wives of wealthy Chinese men of the past served as the same aesthetic and entertainment function as a sign of male privilege. In the modern West, it is relative um, economic abundance. Many strict sexual traits have once made on indigenous people that the wealthy have passed on via the ideas to the masses. And that idea is that sex and trade in women are commodities. So we see female office workers tottering to the job in silky high heeled shoes, such as so as they're worn only by royalty. And these women are courtiers to their ladies. And they were originally devised to be born to be worn by the sacred priest to keep their manner from escaping into the ground. Now, I'll pause there. That seems like some odd imagery that verbiage is a little different. If one is not familiar with ancient cultures um, or different cultures, a lot of that stuff sounds just kind of odd. Um, essentially, what they're saying is um, in patriarchal cultures globally, because this isn't just a Western problem. This is an actual consciousness evolutionary shift on the planet. As it says here, that what they're essentially saying is once patriarchal cultures began to become dominant, um, the only or the best way to show that you have reached the top of the world is to essentially bound to bind a woman and to bind a woman for amusement. So in the Chinese culture, for example, they is talking about the geisha, the geisha um, are essentially, you know, women who are. Um, you know, they carry themselves in a very particular way, basically a prostitute, but they prostate themselves in a way to where they are, their whole embodiment is nothing more than the acquiescence of a male desire, even down to the shoes they wear, which puts them up on a, an extremely high angle that literally mutates the shape of their feet. Uh, because putting them up on those heels, uh, you know, creates some sense, you know, some type of change in sensory, uh, sensory perception to where it makes them more exciting to look at. Uh, same thing here in the American workplace, what they talked about in the formation of the American workplace. Again, it's a it's the patriarchal structure. So most men are bosses and the owners of tops of the tops of the corporations. 
So the dress codes that are made are essentially tailored to women wearing more fitted clothes so that they can please uh, visually please the hardworking men while they're at work. And the women are essentially nothing more than um, there to catch the men when their mana falls. Um, and again, that mana falls, that's one of that's a loose extrapolation, but when they talk about the example here, talking about the sacred priests and they having women in the priests and they're, they're just there for the manna falling. The manna that they're talking about is the ejaculation. Uh, priests were not allowed to, you know, have sex, but it never was said that priests couldn't masturbate. And so essentially, when the priests had temple prostitutes, um, literally speaking, the priests, you know, had their own part of town where they did all of the work for the city and all of those sorts of things and the people who needed spiritual assistance. And they, uh, because they were, you know, their sole job was to be dedicated to those temples, they couldn't have families, but they could have temple priests that were there to do, um, to basically, you know, uh, deal with their sexual desires. And so they caught their manna, meaning that they caught their life force, meaning that they was over there jerking them off. So even in a sacred space, where you are supposed to be the conduit for whatever God of your culture is, you could openly and brazenly have women, even children, women, actually, if you look deeper into just those time periods, that's a whole nother video, a whole nother conversation. Looking deep into those time periods, even if you are a priest, you could have a priestly woman that was there just for your sexual desires and it was okay. So again, this whole nature of, of perversion, if you want to call it, um, well, essentially I just call it shift because again, everything goes in balance. There was a time when the great mother was ruling and she was cruel and crazy. But nevertheless, as we see here in these shifts in movements, the patriarchal structure as it has continued to manifest itself that has led to modernity has solely positioned women at the feet of their way of understanding consciousness. And so this type of stuff continues on. Extremely sex biased roles are the product of rigid heterosexuality, it says. Intellectual dualism and labor explorative culture. They didn't exist in early societies. As many of the sex customs that did, did, did exist were just uh, the reverse of ours. For example, among hunting and gathering people worldwide, the quote unquote home is not only the property of the woman, um, but it is built by her and it is portable, carried around on her back when she moves. Among traditional Chinese, the women wore pants and the men wore skirts. Among people with the um, Cal Calvade or Calvade customs, the women usually gave birth in relative ease while the husbands wreathed, arrived and howled and growled and grinded their teeth, witnessing the women birth. And among the still pagan 12th century Irish, um, it was the females who pissed standing up while the males actually squatted. So this is just a basic example. These are random examples that even when uh, patriarchy was taking a stronghold on society globally, um, it still had to encounter other cultures that had varied expressions of what dominance is based on gender roles. In uh, this particular book, you know, it only talks about Chinese and, and pagan and stuff like that. It has a very um, kind of uh, post-African kind of <laughs> uh, analysis to it. It actually doesn't really look at any of African cultures that much. It's very Neolithic, but whatever. Regardless of such, the premise actually still stands. Um, that other cultures had completely different standards of what um, a person should be and how they should express themselves. And it wasn't strictly based on a gender role or a gender expectation like we see today. It was strictly based on however that culture came into contact, um, excuse, excuse me, came into interaction with the environment themselves or whatever type of psychological changes it had within, within them. Different cultures were allowed to express themselves in different ways. But if you put a man in a dress today, he's a tranny. <laughs> But nevertheless, we see even more. Indeed, the further one goes back in time, the more bisexual or uh, geandrious is the great mother. As Charlotte Wolfe says in Love Between Women, perhaps the present day lesbian woman is the closest in character to the ancient woman. With her fierce insistence on strength, 
independence and integrity of consciousness. The, the first love object for both women and men is their mother. But in patriarchy, the son has to reject the mother to be able to dominate the wife as a real man. And the daughter must betray her for the sake of submitting to a man. In matriarchal society, this double burden of biological and spiritual betrayal does not occur. For both women and men, there is a close identification with the collective group of mothers, with, um, with Mother Earth and with the Cosmic Mother. And as psychoanalysts keep repeating, this identification and conduce, is conducive to bisexuality in both sexes. But homosexuality in tribal or pagan men was not based on rejection of the mother or the female, as it is often true in patriarchal culture. Rather, it was based on brother love, brother affinity as sons of the mother. And lesbianism among women was not based on fear or rejection of men, but on the daughter's desire to reestablish union with the mother and with her own femaleness. The collective of mothers identified by both daughters and sons was made up of strong, creative, productive, sexually free and visionary women. And so the ideal of womanly of womanliness for both sexes was not enforced on the mindless submissiveness of the oppressed and its patriarchal culture. Now, this particular segment says a whole lot. Now, I know for sure just reading this aspect has brushed up on a whole heap of issues and taboos that a lot of us have been giving. This was a big part of what I was introducing before. This is actually the main part of the argument, our main part of the presentation. As it as it, the big part of what it says as psychoanalysts, like they keep, re, as it says, they keep repeating, <laughs> meaning the stuff has been studied over and over and over again, that there is data that proves as far how the psyche understands sex it is far different how our culture is taught to understand sex. And again, addition to that, patriarchal cultures have simply adopted the, the one way, while matriarchal cultures had the, for lack of a better term, original way. And as we see here, the biggest aspect about it is talking about this, this, um, this lost and confused term of bisexuality. Now, if we talk about bisexuality in modern culture and this patriarchal culture that we're in, bisexuality is essentially only um, allowed, so to speak, or is less of a taboo, so to speak, when women are involved. Um, and, and as the commentary shows here, that still it, it harks back to something that is is of its origin, talking about how the first nature of women was more lesbianistic um, in its um uh, in its design. And if you are someone who's been listening to this series of videos, as we talked about in the first couple of videos, talking about the origin of existence and the origin of what eventually became human bodies, we understood that the bodies that were in existence before were actually primarily female. And these females did reproduce asexually, meaning there were no men as far as in a physical form were around. So if that is the case, which science is continually proving to be true, we are actually admitting that the first humanoid type of people were full on lesbians. And that's just the end of it. I know it's kind of crazy to draw a weird conclusion like that, but that honestly is what the, as far as the record of human development um, shows, as far as galactic human development shows, that is what was taking place. And so in a sense, like I say, these energies have never dissipated. They only shift, move, and change for as far as the galactic great work of eventually getting everything out of this low vibration into the higher one. It has to swing all the way down the, uh, the evolutionary ladder, if you want to call it that, and then swing all the way back up again. So again, all we're seeing here is from this, um, this great cosmic creation of singular, um, singular beings that have all of the energies within them to eventually slowing down further, further, further to these dualistic male, female bodies. Even though the external bodies still have slowed down, the capacity for the internal connection is still there. And so as the um, psychoanalysts, you know, have been um, contributed here to saying is that if if we just strictly analyze the cultural influences and we strictly analyze the nature behind how people do things, 
without layering on these cultural um, affluences, we will see that there are a great number of people who are homosexuals, not because they feel rejected by the opposite sex, not because they are misfits of society, not because there's some odd taboo um, individual, not because they were made wrong and something's wrong with their internal wiring, and definitely not because they are cursed. It is because they are actually the great mother incarnate. Well, we, essentially we all are, but in turn, the manifestation or the energetic structure within their body, inside of their spiritual makeup, not just their external makeup, has a strong desire to be completely around that energetic presence. And as far as the sexual activity of the person, in order for them to have full expression of the energetic presence, they have to express it in their physical behavior as well. And so when we talk about this whole bisexual, gay, whole nature of things, yes, we're talking about some individuals who have experienced some type of trauma and they have been turned out. However, there are certain individuals who are nothing more than conduits for the original base energy structure. And they're doing nothing more than being another piece of recollection, another piece of reconnection, another entity that is going to demonstrate the energetic balance that needs to take place in order for the next manifestation that as we continue to swing up in vibration to happen. You know, I'm saying this all deep, but here's a, here's something crazy to ponder. As, a, as, as I've said before, and as all of spiritual people who really understand the larger picture know, like I say, we're swinging down and then swinging back up. If in the origins of what the original manifestations were before all of the vibrations started to slow down, says we were all feminine in our actual nature, and we were all singular in a typical type of identity, meaning there was only one type of body, what do you think are the beginning stages of the upswing are after we've reached the bottom? If we've reached the bottom and completely separated into complete dualistic expressions of masculine and feminine, and then we begin to swing back up again, the proverbial uh, spiritual ladder, that means these energies are going to come back together again. And so as they are coming back together again, the physical manifestations of the singularity will begin to display themselves more and more. Meaning that this whole growth, so to speak, of homosexuality, bisexuality, sexual freedom that seems to be taking place. Well, for one, it's a big in, in 2018, a big of it is cultural control. Um, we're not really going to get into that. Um, but yes, the other aspect of it is we are in an energetic shift and the mother energy is returning back to a dominant form. And so you have to reconcile yourself with this energy if you want to continue to move in your best way. And there are a multitude of ways of doing it. And yes, sexual expression is one of the many. And so because it is simply just one of the many, that's just a, a special note that we must really begin to shift our focus away what somebody is doing in that area. Now, I do understand for certain communities, you know, people are afraid about it because it, one may think of some type of form of genetic annihilation, you know, saying it's people participating in that, then there'll be no more people. But again, when you have a, a very keen and aware spiritual eye, you will see that this existence that we have is much larger than your very small contained community. And, and if we are going to continue to understand the matriarchal nature of spirit and existence and that this spirit and existence comes from a wholly other orientation and that is the one fueling and propelling this one, we must begin to see, feel, think and do things with that awareness. Because if we continue to be mad at someone for being bisexual, mad at someone for being homosexual, mad at someone for being a transsexual, X, Y, Z, we are missing out on participating on the energetic shift to help release our souls out of these bodies. 
because that's actually part of the biggest trick. Again, if we know the larger story, we know we're nothing more. We're doing nothing more than being on a soul journey. Our soul and our and or our spirit is not of the same material substance. We our soul is inhabiting these things and we're enjoying a ride as the ride in the movements of the theme park keeps getting destroyed and rebuilt and we get something else to experience. But if we continue to stay intellectually, emotionally and cognitively stuck where we are in, in our expectations of what we are supposed to be, we will never be able to get off the ride or a one one ride in a very, very large intergalactic theme park. And so the great mother here and in this great mother energy is the energy that is closer to or is the gateway for us to keep the mind of openness and not a mind that's based in rejection, not a mind that's based in fear, not a mind that's based in worldly expectation. Because again, the worldly expectation is the patriarchal um, fatherhood side of energy. And again, we don't want to dismantle it, but we do and have to rail reel it in and bring it into balance in our cognitive expressions. And so we'll go on a little bit more. In many of the most ancient images of the goddess, she is shown with both breasts and phallus, a hermaphrodite, or like I say, for the pop culture term, a tranny. The bearded Ishtar, as it's called, is divine bisexuality stressed as her absolute power. Um, they got the bearded Ishtar and another occult symbol is that of um, of the Baphomet. You know, for those who don't know or for those who only watch YouTube videos about that stuff, they think that's satanic and blah, blah, blah and all of this Illuminati stuff. But again, um, but again, the Baphomet being in male oriented um, um bisexual um figure that is just the male aspect of of singularity inside the body and the bearded ishtar is the female example of bringing all of your energies together inside of your body again these symbols when they're expressed in a human form are giving you a direct indication symbol to what you need to do internally not necessarily externally but internally, when you make these changes and these shifts, that's what it looks like. But anyway, going for it, it says the divine bisexuality stressed in her absolute power, especially over her own sexuality, which was a spiritual as well as an emotional, physical expression. Male shamans in many primal cultures wore women's clothing and live like women, often in homosexual relationships. The Neolithic goddess was served in her temples by bisexual or lesbian priestess and by bisexual or homosexual priests. And the disorder of the late Neolithic in the transition from matriarchy to patriarchy, eunuch priests served her, men who castrated themselves in an orgiastic identification with the goddess. One branch of the Essenes, a Semitic sect, in which Jesus was later associated with in the Quran in the Book of the Dead, these groups of people were, um, as a legit group, the eunuchs, were placed in the west coast of Turkey. But what we know of this period, men were feeling under extreme pressure to identify either with the ancient great mother or with the militant new male gods, and their devotion to both sides went to extremes. Because of such acts, they became politicized and the rise of patriarchal misogyny, a fantasizing sex phobia, entered the world. So again, this is just one paragraph that talks about how one culture made a diametric shift within the world. Again, there's more stuff about this that you could research and explore. Just, just research the history of patriarchal cultures and patriarchal religions and you'll find this exact same central theme. That to be uh, just flat out with it, dudes who were basically religious fanatics under the whole idea that you're supposed to prostrate yourself and resist and, and basically deny yourself as purity to God. These dudes literally got mad because out of their extreme frustration due to lack of sexual expression, 
went on and dominated the world and said everybody needs to suppress themselves like we do because we are very angry individuals. Now, again, I'm saying this very casually and kind of <laughs> off the cuff. But again, if you just research the history, that's just really what happened. Scientifically, it talks about that. You need sexual expression. You need to get that nut off. <laughs> you can't hold it in. Because if you do, you may cultivate certain imbalanced ideas inside of you and then you may go express yourself from that lack of balance. And so sex phobia is nothing more than people who are uh, religious fanatics and denied themselves physical pleasure and told the world that they need to do the same. But they didn't tell the world first. They told women first and most passionately so. And again, they told women so because this literally is an energetic continuum of what a shift in consciousness can uh, of, of the shift of consciousness that has taken place in a vast majority of people. This is very literal and direct, and it goes right to the heart of things. Women are devalued in culture because culture has learned to devalue spirit. Flat out. If spirit, we ain't talking about religion. When spirit, the core energy presence, we ain't talking about God that emerged out of spirit. We ain't talking about angels that emerged out of spirit. We ain't even talking about demons because demons are actually the original part of spirit. If we gonna real get, get into some real uh, spooky stuff. In essence, again, when we tap into the energies that it, that came out of the great mother, the father projected energies of structure, we orient our lives and our ways around that. And everything that we do tangibly manifests itself as such. So if the energies that emerged out of the mother go in one direction that is diametrically opposed to what her central um, location or her central direction is, if you tap into those energies, you in and of yourself will do the same. And again, we can claim that many of us are not doing it. But if we really look with a critical eye of how we treat women in mass culture, we are doing it. Men desecrate women all the time and women are at each other's necks cat fighting all the time. Regardless of how you look at it, women keep losing. And that, again, is a product of the conscious awareness of how people actually understand the flow and transmission of spirit itself. And so, again, things like this book here, The Great Cosmic Mother by Monica So and Barbara Ann Moore are just doing the small contribution that they can to help rekindle and remind us of where we came from and where we eventually will go once we awaken to the origins of what we actually are. And so we'll go on in one last one last uh, exposition here. Creative women and men of all ages have found rigid heterosexuality in conflict with being fully alive and aware on all levels, sexual, psychic and spiritual, because it is a mental and emotional limitation as well as a physical one. It is as if on all levels of our being, we are split in half, locked into one half and forbidden from the other. We are split against ourselves and against the self in the other. And by this moralistic opposition of natural polarities, it is the very depths of our soul that has been cracked. And as a result of this war, necrophilia, alienation at the root and all other things have taken place. And if we do not resolve this, we will all die all of a mutual murder that is total suicide. And so the suicide that the authors are speaking of isn't talking about a gun blow to the head. What we're talking about here is a full on loss of the progression of society and a dissolution of all of the great things that have been produced through the mother. Yes, many great things have been produced through the mother, through the ideology of patriarchal and father, excuse me, father mentality ideals. 
But we have reached the point in society where those father ideals are strangling the mother. And so consciousness in and of itself will not allow this to happen because we're talking about permanent energies that are never essentially going away. If we as a people continue to make shifts and strangle that energy, the energy in its bottlenecked form will only spring back. And those of us who are not aware and not ready for the shift in the springing out of energy that has been bottled up, we will ultimately miss out on all of the wonderful energy, the wonderful opportunities, the wonderful change of actual environment that will take place. And we will be once again trapped in the dualism of feeling that we have missed out or been left out. When all it is, is that we have been unaware of the core presence and essence of our mother. So this edition of the Great Cosmic Mother has very faintly touched on bisexuality and sexual expression and how all of that is still linked to the origin of things. But this is just a moment for us to remember and for us to ponder upon this. If we look within ourselves and look at ourselves as pure energy and not as human forms, we will see that both the male energy and that the female energy is resonating within us right now. And if we're talking purely about balancing our energies for the sole sake of releasing our soul back to where we came, we must be very mindful that any type of energetic connection and activity that we participate in should be for the sole purpose of rekindling, remodeling or refolding whatever type of re on our energy to get us back to that central place. And, it, and if in our activities being pure to the energetic form of things, we come into encounters, whether it be sexual base, business base, relationship base, any type of base. This isn't just about sex. When we come into or when we are invited to participate in an energetic exchange that will help heal and reconnect the broken parts of our fragmented consciousness, we can we have the ability to make the choice to respond with the same energetic pull of the great mother or to follow the influence of the father's eyes that we see directly before us in the situation and allow the environment to tell us no. And again, that is stressed for any activity in life. Be sure to keep the spiritual eye and the spiritual awareness of the great mother and her nurture ring and her desire to reconnect and her desire to bring all things together. Not some things, all things. And as we continue, continue to be a conduit to that, allow ourselves to literally embody it in ways to which we may have never thought possible. Again, this is the Great Cosmic Mother. I am Ahmad Blair Brown. This is We Meditate. Many blessings to you all.